Hey, my name is Jesus, and I am the youth pastor here at Charlotte Assembly of God. We are so glad you are jumping on to watch the service from Sunday morning. If this is the first time you've ever tuned into our content, welcome. It is so great to have you with us. For more information about the church, our pastor, and what we believe, go to charlotteag.org or download the CAG app. Each week we gather in person and online to align our hearts in our mission to love God, love people, and live to serve. I hope as you watch this video, you grow closer to Christ and live to love others better. So grab a cup of coffee and your Bible as we dive deep into this week's message. Are you excited to be in the house of the Lord today? Yeah. Come on, give me some noise. I want to know if you're excited to be in the house of the Lord. All right. I need you to listen. I need you to listen good and I need you to listen loud. Uh, I'm going to have you turn in your Bible to Romans chapter 3. And if you get there, just stand up and say, got it. Oh man, we're in a bad place already. This is not a good place. Just say, got it. Romans chapter 3, uh, just a little hint there, it comes after Romans chapter 2. And that comes after Romans chapter 1. So it's, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Exodus. I uh, got you. Come on. If you're there, say, got it. Romans chapter 3. Uh, as, you're, uh, as you're turning there for a moment, uh, I want to remind you that we're in the middle of a series. It's kind of a scary series for me because uh, I have committed to teaching, preaching all of the book of Romans to you. Now you have to understand there's 16 chapters in Romans. There's zero chance I could do it verse by verse, line by line, because we would be here until the rapture came or till the end of my career. So just know that. But what I'm doing is I'm taking the big idea. Everybody say big idea. idea. I'm taking the big idea out of every chapter and then I'm communicating that to you. The challenge with that is, is some of the big ideas actually overlap across chapters because when they put those numbers in, it wasn't like perfect. Does that make sense? The Bible's perfect, but the way they put those numbers doesn't always perfectly match the writer's thoughts. So Romans chapter three is finally a, a place. You're standing. Let me just read it to you so you can sit down. All right. Romans chapter three. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him. And we all rejoice without keeping the requirements of the law. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone in the room who believes no matter who we are. For everyone, everyone in the room has sinned and we all fall short of glorious standard. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in the present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness for he himself is fair and just and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Other translations, more formal equivalencies would say he was just and the justifier. So Holy Spirit, I just con- confess one more time that 100% depend upon you. There's nothing I could do in my own accord, but I'm leaning to you and I'm trusting you. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would help me to do what I can't do. And Lord, would you give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart that would perceive all that you have for us today. May lives be changed, hearts transformed, saved, set free. And all God's people said? Amen. All God's people said? Amen. I'm going to have a seat. We're in Romans chapter 3, which is good because uh, I'll, I'll reiterate in a moment. Romans 1 and Romans 2 were kind of bad news, sad. They weren't like full of a ton of hope and grace. And, and yet some of that's there. Romans chapter 3 kind of shifts and we're getting into a, a place of hope. And so that is what you need to know. If you haven't heard Romans 1 or 2, then I would encourage you to go back to our, our app, website, uh, YouTube page, and, and you can find those there for you. I uh, turned 16 and I got a car and I was really excited to have a car as every 16 year old is. And back in the 90s, everybody say yay for the 90s. How many of you guys graduated high school in the 90s? Any, any of my millennial friends in here? All right, so a few of us did. I got a Mitsubishi Eclipse. 
And it was like this two door car. I thought it was, it was a sports car, but it wasn't like a sports car. You know what I'm saying? It was like a, a sports car in disguise. It had like a, a scoop on the hood and then it had a spoiler on the back and it had uh, those doors that when you open them, the seatbelt would go eek. And then when you got in and shut the door, the seatbelt would go eek. You know what I'm saying? That, that's the kind of car it was. And so I was very excited to have it. And I knew right away out of the gate that I wanted a car that was a stick shift. I wanted to learn how to drive a stick shift. And so my dad thought that was a good idea because I would have a more likelihood of keeping my hands busy and focusing on driving. And so the perfect Mitsubishi Eclipse showed up and we went, we bought it and I, I drove it home. And I wasn't uh, driving for very long when I got my very first speeding ticket. I, uh, I drove fast. I like driving fast still. I've had a few speeding tickets since then. But when I was 16, I was driving 65-ish in, in a 35 zone. I was on Pioneer, yeah, everybody, woo. I was on Pioneer Parkway and it was very late. I was rushing home for, for curfew because I, I didn't want to get in trouble there. And so I'm driving and I'm going a little too fast, nothing crazy, but maybe 30, 35 over the speed limit. And I, I'm driving, I'm singing probably Nirvana songs, you know, come. I know just when I can go there. All right. The 90s just grab a hold of me. That's all I'm going to say. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm driving and before I, I even know what to do, there's a police car behind me. I'm like, uh-oh, this is not good. I don't like the sound of this. And so I pull over like you're supposed to and he takes all my information and he gives me a ticket. And I'm like, oh, I'm guilty of speeding and now I got to pay a fine. Interesting enough, I thought I could pay that. My dad never find out, but that's a whole other day. He did find out because we had to go to court. As a 16-year-old driver in Texas, you have to go to court for that very first speeding ticket. And so I show up at court and I'm guilty. I was going too fast. I'm in trouble. Got to pay the fine. Am I ever going to drive again? Is this ever going to work out? What's going to happen? Is my dad going to take my car? I don't even know. And I stood in that situation and they gave me what's called in Texas, I don't know about Michigan, it's called deferred adjudication. In other words, because it was my very first speeding ticket ever that I'd had, not my last, but my first, I actually got deferred adjudication, which means in practical layman's terms that the speeding ticket I got, because it was my first one, I was justified from the crime as if I had never sped in my life and they wiped that ticket away. All I had to do was pay the fee. It would never be on my record. It'd never go against me. And I was outside of myself thinking, all right, I beat the system because of deferred justification. And it was just as if I had never sped down Pioneer Parkway at 60, 75 ish. It was over, done, finito. One of the questions I get asked very, very, very often, I mean, I get asked a lot of questions, like people, they hang out with me and they think it's drill the pastor, 20 questions, let me find out everything. And they're usually disappointed to find out that I don't actually know everything. And sometimes my answer to their question is, I actually have the same question. And beyond asking where did Cain and Abel get their wife, probably the most important question I would say, or, or one of the most common questions is, Pastor, I want to know, am I really saved? And I'm thinking, wait, don't you go to church? Aren't we hanging out? And people that have it all together to people who struggle, I get this question asked all the time, Pastor, how do I know if I'm really, 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 really saved? You know, it's like that person, they're about to take off in an airplane and they confess every sin they possibly could think of just in case the airplane goes down, right? We're gonna make sure, you know, for years after I became a believer in Jesus Christ, every night I'd go to bed, I would confess every possible sin I thought I would have committed that day and it always followed up with God and anything I forgot, please forgive me. 
right? Because we want to know, we want to make sure some of you, you know exactly what I'm talking about because you have come to the altar, you've raised your hand 10 million times because you're like, I just want to make sure. And I don't think there's anything wrong with making sure. I mean, we understand that heaven is forever, hell is forever. And it's a good idea to know that we have been saved, set free, set apart, we're redeemed. But that question is asked to me so many times. They're like, pastor, I don't know, but I want to make sure that I'm redeemed. Can you give me some type of assurance? And the assurance that I can give you is found in the scriptures. Because it, for, let me just go back and, and remind you of this. It paints a very dark picture. Because it says, for everyone, every person in this room and all of you watching at home online, it says, every one of us fall short. We all I'm just kidding. Just, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. And so what Romans chapter three, Romans one tells a dark, dark story. Romans two says the very same thing. So Romans one, if you're an unbeliever, you're in trouble, you're just, you, you did it, you've done it, you're convicted, you're guilty. Uh, Romans chapter two flips the page to believers, people who go to church and, and he says, you did it, you've done it, you're guilty, you deserve the penalty. And he kind of leaves you on this cliffhanger of, uh, uh, what now? And then Romans 3, it picks up and what Paul does, it's beautiful. The story turns and it is a beautiful, beautiful explanation. Almost didn't get that word out. Explanation of how we can be made right with God. Because if Romans 1 tells us how we're wrong with God and Romans chapter 2 tells us how we're wrong with God, it would only make sense that we're communicated how we can be right with God. But before I tell you, let me back it up just a second. Romans 3, 10 through 12 says, as the scriptures say, no one is righteous. No one's right with God. Not even one. No one is truly wise. Tell that to your husband. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good. Not a single one. In other words, it tells us that we all have issues with breaking the heart of God. It says that we sin with our mind. In other words, no one really, truly, outside of the grace of God, understands who God is. Uh, it says we sin with our heart. In, in other words, we have allowed our heart to not chase after God. Our heart chases after idols and, and what this life has to offer us. And, and that heart is something that is straight away from truth. And then he says, you know, we, we sin with, with our will. We, we've all turned from what God wants for us and we've turned towards what we want for us. And I know there's no stubborn firstborn children in the room that do what they want to do. But the truth is we all fall short of God's righteous standard. In fact, if we were to measure ourselves against God's righteousness, there is not a single human being other than Jesus that is without sin. And not a one of us in this room can justify ourselves before God. All men, all women, young, old alike are sinners. But this is something I want to point out to you because this brings me tremendous hope. With all of that bleak picture, this is what we know. No one seeks after God. You may think you found Jesus, but can I tell you something? Jesus found you. I love that passage in scriptures in Romans somewhere where he says he was found by those who were not looking. You didn't look for him, he looked for you. And because nobody is seeking after God, God actually seeks after us. That's what makes Luke 19.10 so important. He says, for the son of man, talking about Jesus, came to seek and save that which was lost. It's actually true that we are the parable of the lost coin where the whole house is swept and the coin is found and, and there's a celebration for that uh, we are that lost sheep that black sheep you're the black sheep of the family and we're that lost sheep that wanders away from is it a herd of sheep I don't know what you got from a bunch of sheep and God leaves the 99 and he comes after you. We're all the lost son, the prodigal son who is feeding pigs and he gets his priorities right. He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go home and I'm going to see my father who maybe there will be grace from him. We're all the lost. We are far from him. 
but it's Jesus who comes after us. And what I love about the Lord is his steadfast love never ceases. His, his mercies never end. They're new every morning. And what we have is we have a God that presses hard against us. He longs for us. He comes after us and you can't save yourself. He saves us. I wrote it this way. It's not what we do that saves us. It's what Jesus has done. Amen. And we believe in that. Yeah. And that's what saves us. Wherever you are, God comes after you. I mean, think about Adam and Eve and we believe in original sin and, and you, you need Jesus. And there's, there's no doubt that Genesis chapter three lays this out very clearly. Here, here's Adam and Eve and they're in the garden and I don't know what your question would be when you get to heaven, but I kind of want to know, how long was Adam and Eve in the garden before they blew it? Like was it thousands of years that they were getting it right and then one day, boom, it's over? Or like many of you in the room, it was like 10 minutes, right? Yeah, yeah. 10 minutes, like God says, all right, don't touch that, don't eat that. Uh, all the others, but not this one. And then many of you in the room, five minutes later, bam, you would have eaten that apple, fruit, whatever it would be. All right, I'd love to know how long that was, but the truth of the matter is it doesn't matter at all because Jesus, the Lord, makes it very clear that they break the heart of God and they do what they're not supposed to do. And here's what happens, Adam and Eve hide. They're, they're hiding from God. And God comes down in, in the cool of the morning is what it tells us. And he's calling out Adam's name. He's looking for Adam. He's, he's looking for Eve. And, and he actually comes after them. Why? He knew what they did. He asked a few rhetorical questions like, who told you you were naked? And he knew the answer to that. And if he had waited for them to come and tell him, he would have waited forever. You remember Sandlot where the kid's like, forever. <laughs> no, they're hiding, they're shaking, they're, they're nervous, they're scared, rightfully so. They broke the heart of God. Their eyes were open to good and evil. And I don't know where you are today. But whatever you're hiding behind, whatever you're hiding from, I want you to know that we serve a good God that loves you and cares for you and is coming after you. He finds you wherever you are. It may be a pit, it may be a mire, it may be mud, it may be bad decisions, bad habits. And he finds us and he rescues us. Why would he do that? Because he loves you and he created you and he formed you and, and he knit you in your mother's womb. You belong to him. And so I want you to know that we have a God that comes after us. And that's what Paul's saying here is you're okay. It's not your own doing. It's God's. And I wonder... If when we read Romans 1 and 2, we have this idea, well, well, Paul's just making me feel bad about myself. I don't like Romans 1 and 2. Read the book of James, see how well you feel then. And Paul is not telling us the sob story or he's not painting such a bleak picture because he wants to make us feel shame. He's doing it because there's salvation and he wants us to be saved. And if you don't know how bad things are, you never appreciate how good they can be. And so our, our thought process, and I, I find this to be very common in church. It was common to me for 20 years, and then God set me free, and so I may be five feet ahead of you, but let me say it like this. Many of us in this room, we know Jesus saved us, but we live like we have to save ourselves. We have no problem saying, Jesus saved me and set me free and, and singing those songs, but we really do live a life like it is me who's saving me. And there's this idea that crosses our mind or, or maybe it creeps into our behavior and we think, we think that, well, I got to read more of the scriptures and then uh, I can be saved. 
right? Or, or like maybe you're like me, I, I wanted to pray exactly one hour. If I prayed less than an hour, it didn't count. And I would watch the clock, watch the clock, watch the clock. Can you imagine if you're on a date with someone and just keep looking at the clock, keep looking at the clock? You would think, I don't think they want to be with me. And you would be right. I have a clock in my office when I counsel. It faces me, not them. But don't tell the first service side. And we think that, well, if I just serve in, in every capacity and I do everything that I could do at the church, then, then God will love me and God will forgive me. And, and we, we kind of want you to serve all over the place without getting burned out. Don't get me wrong. Serving is a good idea, but you can serve on hospitality, safety team, in the nursery. You can serve with future. It doesn't matter because the truth is we cannot do enough because it's not us doing it. It's Jesus doing it. Jesus is the one that saves us and sets us free and changes our life. But we act like I got to do all of these things and they're not bad things. Usually they're very, very good things that I would say you need to be doing. You need to be reading your Bible. You gotta be praying. You need that relationship with Jesus. Here's a Southern word. You don't wanna backslide. I'll leave that for someone else, Pastor Robin. Not that you're backsliding, but you can explain it much better. <laughs> But are you? I don't know. You laughed a little too hard. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> and, it, and, and we know in our mind that, that we can't save ourselves, but we, we do get in this pattern of thinking we can save ourselves by the way we live our life. And, and we live our life from a place of salvation, not to salvation. And here's what happens is, is when we live our life thinking it's what I do that makes all the difference, even though it makes a difference, when we live our life from this place of I've got to do this and I've got to do this and I've got to do this, if God is going to forgive me and I'm going to be saved and I'm going to be redeemed, what happens inevitably is you're going to mess up. You're not going to read your Bible every day. Hey, I, here, lean in. Come on. I don't read my Bible every day. Whew, scandalous, I know. Scandalous, just terrible. Sometimes I'm on the golf course instead of reading my Bible, but don't tell, oh my gosh. When we live our life like that and we make these rigid rules, and some of you, you can do those rigid rules, but you're not happy. Inevitably, you're going to break one of them, and, and then what creeps in is this thing called guilt. Hey, some guilt is good because it leads us to conviction. We talked about that last week. But the truth is, I'm not talking about the guilt that leads us to conviction. What I'm talking about is the guilt that's really called condemnation. And, and we, we mess up and, and we don't get it right. And we think, oh, no, I'm not saved anymore. And we act like salvation is so fragile. And condemnation crushes us. Here's how we know the difference. Condemnation says there's no way out. Conviction always gives us a door of hope. And some of us, we live under that good old-fashioned thing called legalism. Where it's all about the outward. And if I can look the part and if I can do the part and... I'm saving myself, even though you know that you can't. That's a rough place to live. I lived there for a very, very long time. And the enemy is good at making us feel condemned and making us feel like God is mad at us. Have you ever thought you did something so bad that you couldn't go pray because God didn't want to hear you? That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. When you make a mistake, that's exactly should be your first response is prayer. And what happens is when we live a life of condemnation and legalism and we think we can save ourselves, even though we know we can't save ourselves, we end up hiding behind good works, condemnation, legalism. Man, there, there would be somebody that would drop out of church and they've been attending really faithfully and I, and I get a hold of them and, I, and what's going on and, and it's always, Pastor, you won't believe what I did. I don't care what you did. The best place to be is church when you did it. I mean, well, hold on. <laughs> Forget it. Forget it. That's not what I'm saying. 
But watch, here's our hope for, for yet God in his grace freely makes us right, freely makes us right, freely makes us right. In his sight, he did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. Amen. Look, when, when God finds us, he does what we can't do, he saves us. And it's because we cannot save ourselves. It's called good old fashioned grace. We're being careless, unmerited favor. I love God's grace. May you love and understand and appreciate grace. I'm not talking about cheap grace. I'm talking about the real thing. And so when Adam and Eve are found and they're there and they're exposed and, and, and they're, they're naked. And you know, all those pictures are like sewing like fig leaves. And I don't know if that's really how it went down. It seems like that what scripture says, but don't look it up right now, please. God finds them and, and what does he do? He, 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 there's a penalty, but he covers them. There's an animal that is, that is And there's a sacrifice that is made and it rises to heaven as an incense. And, and then there's this animal skin. I'd rather have the leaves to be honest with you, but there's this animal skin that is made to cover them. And I don't know exactly how or what it looked like, but we do know because of Seth and we know because of Abel especially that somehow in that moment where there is a sacrifice made that the covenant was restored and the relationship with God was redeemed. Whatever that looked like. And I want you to understand this morning, it's through the sacrifice of his son on the cross that we are redeemed. Not our own efforts. It's not what we do, it's what he did. Yes. And the term we use, it, it's a big term, it's, it's a weighty term, and yet it's so simple, I, I struggle to explain it to you. It's called justification by faith. In other words, we are saved by trusting not in our faithfulness, we are saved by trusting in Jesus's faithfulness because Jesus did the work that we can do. And so the really cool thing about this is not only are we clothed and no longer exposed, but God takes the righteousness of Jesus Christ and he puts it on our record. Hey, I got to tell you this quick story until first service and it doesn't count against my time. When my dad applied to college, he got my uncle's transcripts and my uncle was valedictorian. <laughs> my dad, not so much. Jesus was righteous and perfect and had it all to, I hope he's not watching, that'd be, I don't, I don't, I don't think he is today. I mean, I wouldn't tell him either, to be honest. He takes the righteousness of Jesus and he applies it to your life. Wow, that's good. That's right. he, he, he wipes your record away and he imputes Jesus's record upon yours. In other words, when the books are opened up, it's not a list of all your stuff that you did wrong. It's a list of what he did right. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. The truth is this, there's nothing wrong with looking at truth. We just don't want to stay here. We are guilty. You did take too many cookies out of the cookie jar. You did go 65, 7-ish, and at 35. You know, I, it's some, it, the miracles I haven't had a speeding ticket, and I shouldn't say that, but I don't think I've had a speeding ticket since I was like 21 years old. I definitely deserve one. <laughs> but I'm smart. I know where to slow down. Potterville, slow down, way down. Because they're waiting for you. And then you flash that light on that. I don't know why I'm going to start. I gotta, I gotta go. We are guilty, we have sinned, and there's a price to pay for that. 
And that's actually the point. That's the point of Jesus' life. It's the point of Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection. And just like a sacrifice was made for Adam and Eve, a sacrifice has been made for us, and that's Jesus. You see, you're thinking, well, this is so elementary, Pastor. I've heard this, but do you live it? Or are you still living like it all depends on you? In the Old Testament, all you had to do was behave and, and do the law, and, and they weren't very good at that, by the way. And if you follow the law, if you follow the prophets, every one of these prophets and kings, they were looking forward by faith to the redemption that would come through the Messiah. Now, New Testament, it's not behavior that makes you right. Behavior is a result of that. But in the New Testament, it's belief in Jesus that makes you right. And the law now becomes written upon our hearts because of Holy Spirit. In other words, we look, as New Testament believers, we look back by faith at what Jesus has done. It's belief in Jesus and what he did on the cross that saves you and it saves me. It is the hope of the world. And so putting our faith in what he did, not what we have done, is the crucial point. Luke 23, 39 through 43 illustrates this beautifully. It says this, one of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. There's sarcasm here. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes. But this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you today you will be with me in paradise. This thief did everything wrong and he recognized that Jesus had done everything right. And so there's this moment where there's Jesus on the cross and he is dying. And then there's a criminal on one side. Then there's a criminal on the other side. And they are dying for their crimes and, and they deserve the penalty. And I hope whatever they stole is worth stealing because that's a heavy price to pay. And the one is scoffing him and, and the other is saying, whoa, hold up, buddy. We're the ones that deserve to die. And he says this, he said, Jesus, but remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And Jesus looks at that faith and he says, today you will join me in paradise. Yeah, right. And you know what that thief did? Nothing. He was stuck to a cross. There's nothing he could have done. He couldn't serve in the nursery. I mean, Pastor Robin would take him. <laughs> Penny would say, yeah, leave the cross over there. Just come on in. Those nails don't look so good for kids. Over there. And I'm not mocking something serious. What I want you to understand is that thief did nothing. He didn't have the time to do anything. But what he did do was he recognized who Jesus was and what Jesus would accomplish. And he said, would you remember me? He believed in Jesus, not his own efforts. And he was saved. You're the criminal, I'm the criminal. We're the one that deserves the death and the penalty. But Jesus died to death so we didn't have to die. We are justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Romans 3.22, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Christ. And this is true for everyone in this room who believes no matter who we are. And this is what I love as Bethany comes back. Or somebody comes back. I bet it's Bethany though. Do you, is it? Do we know yet? <laughs> Bethany, is it you? Oh, it is, it is. She's the black sheep. Turn around. Show me the black sheep. It should be a black sheep. She's a lost sheep. But if you're lost, you're a black sheep. Justification is not a process. We're not being justified. That's sanctification. That's for another time. Not for today. 
we're actually declared justified. And so the truth is God declares us righteous. And what we see in the scriptures is because of Jesus Christ on that cross, he declares us that we are not guilty. One of my favorite stories, I tell it all the time, and I'll land here. There's this woman who's caught in adultery. And the very act is what the scriptures tell us. And they drag her out and they throw her before Jesus and and they're all ready to stone her because the penalty for her crime was death, death sentence. And he says, all right, fair enough. There's a penalty for the crime, the penalty stoning, the loss of her life. And he who has never made a mistake, you go ahead, you start, you tell the stone. And one by one, it says from the oldest to the youngest, which is significant, they dropped their stone and went home. And Jesus looks up and I can't even imagine the look in his eyes. And he looks up with compassion and he says, where are your accusers now? And she says, they're gone. And he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. That's us. We do deserve the penalty. We've committed the crime. We we deserve the punishment. And yet what Jesus does for us is something we could not do for ourselves. He doesn't condemn us anymore. He frees us and rescues us and forgives us. Can we abuse that? Absolutely. But that's for another day. That's not today. And Jesus says, look, if, if no, one, no one condemns you, I'm, I'm erasing the record. I'm wiping the slate clean. There is no longer a list of grievances. You are now declared not guilty in the sight of God because he is able to do by going to the cross. He is able to do for you what you'll never be able to do. God through our, I wrote, so God through our faith in Jesus Christ declares us not guilty of the sins that he says we are guilty of. And so the truth is this, we're redeemed because we believe in what Jesus did. Not because of what we do or what we've done. That's grace, that's mercy. And we are forgiven and here's the concept of forgiveness. It's so beautifully communicated as Pastor Jesus gets ready. Psalms 103, 8, the Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to anger and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all of our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love towards those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens and above the earth. He has removed, he's removed our sins as far as the east is from the West. Look, if you put your faith in Jesus, you're saved. If you put your faith in what Jesus did on the cross, your record has been wiped clean. You no longer have to worry standing there before the judge and a gavel coming down. You have been made clean because of what Jesus has done for you. You have been justified by faith. Just as as if you've never sinned and you no longer have to live in a place of fear. You can go on an airplane and not have to do this 10 times because Jesus has said, you are free, you are forgiven. I say because of what I've done, you're not guilty anymore. Give God praise for that. So would you stand all across the room? Because I want to pray for those of you, you're not, I'm not going to have you raise your hand, but there's many of us in the room, we, we believe Jesus saved us, but we're living our life like we save ourselves. And we wonder, have I really done enough? Or am I truly saved? Am, am I truly forgiven? Hey, if you're living a life for Jesus, it won't be perfect. It's a process. But when you believe in what Jesus did on the cross for you, you are justified, just as if you never sinned. And that's powerful. Let me pray for you, lift your hands. Father, I pray your blessing on your people. 
that they would know the freedom that is in Christ, that they would experience forgiveness. And Lord, you would set them free from every lie of the enemy, every, every spirit of condemnation. Lord, that they would walk with you all the days of their life, living in a place of zero condemnation. We pray for that. Break it off of people now. Break it off of people, we pray. Lord, do what only you can do. We are washed and cleansed. Thanks for watching. If you have a prayer request or more questions about God or the church, go to charlotteag.org and hit the connect tab so we can be in contact with you. We hope you have experienced the life-changing love of Jesus Christ through this message. If you are looking to get connected, one easy way is to join us at 7 p.m. on Wednesday nights as we pray. And don't worry, because there is a place for your child or student as well. Have a blessed day, and may Christ's love shine upon you.